Alexei Nikolaevich was the only son of the last Russian emperor, Nicholas II and his wife, the Empress Consort Alexandra. As the only son of the emperor, Alexei was the Tsarevich, or crown prince and heir to the throne of Russia. Following the murder of the Russian imperial family, the House of Romanov, at the hands of a firing squad led by Yakov Yurovsky in Ekaterinburg on July the 17th, 1918, there have been at least 81 known impostors who have posed as the Tsarevich Alexei. However, they would all eventually be exposed as impostors, as the skeletal remains of the imperial family were recovered and identified through DNA testing in the 1990s and 2000s. As we have mentioned in our previous video, Alexei was widely known to have suffered from hemophilia, an inherited genetic disorder that impairs the body's ability to make blood clots, a process needed to stop bleeding. Alexei's illness was known to have been severe, and even what would appear to be insignificant bruises could cause internal bleeding. Because of his illness, Alexei's joints ached, and at times, he was unable to walk by himself. As a result of this, an officer was assigned to Alexei who was responsible for carrying him around and riding with him. Alexei attracted a great deal of attention from impostors for a wide variety of reasons. Not only was Alexei the only son of the deposed emperor, but at the age of just 13 at the time of his murder, he was still a teenager when he died, similarly as the two youngest of his four sisters, the Grand Duchesses Maria and Anastasia. Like his youngest two sisters, Alexei's young age provided impostors with an excuse for any dissimilarities between themselves and their legitimate Romanov targets because of the supposed changes in physical appearance between adolescence and adulthood. In the second of our videos exploring the lives and motivations of the numerous impostors who claim to be the Tsarevich Alexei, we turn our attention to an impostor who emerged in Russia only weeks after the imperial family were murdered, who may have been successful in his attempt to deceive the Russian people into believing he was the Tsarevich had it not been for the efforts of Tsarevich Alexei's former French teacher in exposing him as a fraud. This is the story of Alexei Putsito. Alexei Putsito was believed to be the first of the Romanov impostors to emerge, appearing just less than two months after the murder of the Russian imperial family in Ekaterinburg on the 17th of July 1918. Little is known about the identity and origin of this impostor. He may have been born into a family of good standing, perhaps a noble one, as he appeared to be quite educated and well-read. It is possible that he was the child of exiled Poles from the Minsk province during the Polish uprising of 1863 to 1864. His family may have fled from the Bolsheviks to Siberia, possibly being imprisoned or perishing in the turmoil that reigned at that time. On the 13th of September 1918, a telegram sent from the village of Kashigach was received in the city of Bisk, addressed directly to the commander-in-chief on behalf of the heir Alexei Nikolaevich. The head of the post and telegraph office of Bisk, an individual by the name of Gorshkov, took an interest in the unusual telegram and attempted to contact Mikhail Drazdovsky, a major general of the anti-Bolshevik White Army, in the village two days later for verification. 
Drazdovsky refused to speak to Gorshkov, citing his military commitments, however he was unlikely to have trusted the story. However, an employee of the same office by the name of Semyonov had already managed to communicate with the person who sent the telegram. Semyonov had recalled that an unknown person called him long before the telegram had been sent, demanding information about the trains going to Omsk and whether everything was safe on the railway. The clerk could not give him an answer and was ordered to find out immediately at the station. Semyonov became interested in the name of the interlocutor, but he refused to speak, referring to the fact that the employee would immediately inform the authorities if he knew. However, after Semyonov gave him his word that he would not do anything of the kind, the interlocutor replied, I am the one who was imprisoned in Tobolsk. I believe your word, and therefore I will open up without hiding anything. Listen to me to the end, but don't interrupt. I am the one who lost my dear father, mother, and sisters two years ago. I am the one who was imprisoned in Tobolsk. I am the one who, despite my young years, had to endure humiliation and insults. I am the one who, with the help of friends, eventually fled Tobolsk, using someone's documents. I am Tsarevich Alexei. Simeonov did not listen further, deciding that he was dealing with a mentally unstable individual. After making his feelings clear to the interlocutor, Semyonov soon forgot about what he heard. However, he would appear again, and when dispatching the telegram address to Supreme Ruler and Commander-in-Chief Alexander Kolchak, he said to Semyonov, Do you believe or not what I have said before? Now I will say the name under which I live here. Alexei Putsato. Following this, Semyonov would not have another opportunity to communicate with Alexei Putsato and Gorshkov, despite doubting the information which had been received, nevertheless brought it to the attention of the head of the Tomsk Postal and Telegraph Agency. On the 17th of September, he ordered the transfer of all available information to the Deputy Prosecutor of the District Court for the Bisk District. It appears that shortly after this, Putsato would encounter trouble, having accused the head of the Koshigach Post and Telegraph Office, an individual by the name of Odinsov, of forgery. As a result of the impostor's allegations against him, Odinsov did not want to let him out of Koshigach. In response to this, the wife of the head of the Post and Telegraph Office of Ungude sent a letter to Gorshkov at Bisk, pleading for help for Putsato, as his allegations against Odinsov had supposedly resulted in death threats being directed at him. Gorshkov passed this information to Tomsk and asked for further orders. Following this, Alexei Putsato successfully made his train journey to Omsk. During this time, the anti-Bolshevik Russian state maintained control of Omsk and much of the Siberian region as the Russian Civil War gathered pace. Such a scenario provided Putsato with substantial opportunities, with many sympathetic individuals in positions of influence only too willing to take Putsato at his word, or at least give him the benefit of the doubt. Upon his arrival at the train station, Putsato was greeted with a guard of honor, who were lined up in anticipation of his arrival. Heading the guard of honor was Colonel Pavel Ivanov-Rinov, commander of the Steppe Siberian Corps, which was an infantry corps of the White Guard Siberian Army, who also served as the Minister of War of the Alms government. Ivanov-Rinov was known for his pro-monarchist sentiment, and according to a number of eyewitnesses who were present at the train station, the military band performed a rendition of God Save the King before Ivanov Rinov invited a young man in military uniform without insignia to his car. It is uncertain whether or not Ivanov Rinov was truly convinced of Alexei Putsado's authenticity. However, his presence, imposter or not, 
could serve as a valuable political pawn in the turbulent political environment of the time. Putzito was placed in an apartment in the center of Omsk and attended a series of banquets and made numerous trips to the theater. Putzito would also receive donations of money, gifts, and food. The head of the local post office allegedly brought the imposter a gift of bread and salt and many of the people around him assured him of their eternal devotion. According to Putzito, he managed to escape at one of the stations between Ekaterinburg and Perm in 1917, and after successfully making his escape, was supposedly sheltered by who he described as loyal people. Following this, Putzito made his way east and only revealed his so-called true identity once in the rear of the White Army. However, the imposter would soon encounter a problem, as unfortunately for him, the former French language tutor to the five children of Nicholas II, Pierre Gilliar, was residing in Omsk. Giliar had remained in Siberia following the murders of the Russian imperial family in Ekaterinburg. Giliar had been close to the imperial family and had witnessed events up until they were separated and the family relocated to Ipatyev's house on the 30th of April 1918. While residing in Omsk, Giliar assisted the investigator Nikolai Sokolov, who was appointed by Alexander Kolchak to investigate the murder of the royal family. Giliar recalled that while he was residing in Omsk, there had been persistent rumors that the heir to the throne, Alexei Nikolaevich, had managed to survive. According to Giliar, Putzito had been present in a small town of Altai, and he had been told that the inhabitants had greeted the imposter with enthusiasm and the schoolchildren had made a collection on his behalf. Apparently, one of the white army officers had approached Giliar, wanting to present to him a boy who claimed to be the Cesarevich. It turned out that Alexander Kolchak had received a telegram which asked him to come to the assistance of this bogus Alexei. Fearing that these circumstances might give rise to difficulties, Kolchak had had the imposter brought to Omsk and Giliar was called by the aforementioned white army officer who believed that his evidence would settle the difficulty and put a stop to the rumors which had started to spread throughout Omsk. Without the imposter's knowledge, Giliar paid him a visit. Together with the officer, Giliar waited in an adjacent room to one in which Putzito was present. According to Giliar, the door of the room was open just wide enough to allow him a clear view of Putzito. Giliar observed that the imposter was taller and stronger than the Cesarevich, Alexei Nikolaevich, appearing to be a year or two older than Nicholas II's son and heir. Despite these clear differences, Giliar did acknowledge that the imposter's sailor's uniform, hair color and style bore at least some resemblance to the Cesarevich. However, he would assert that this is as far as the resemblance between the two would go. Giliar informed the officer of his observations, and following this, he was finally introduced to the imposter, who showed no understanding of who Giliar was. Following their introduction, Giliar, playing along with the imposter's pretensions, asked the supposed Cesarevich about his French lessons, and put several questions to him in French. Unsurprisingly, the imposter showed no understanding of French, or any recollection of the many French lessons the Cesarevich had with Giliar. When a reply was insisted upon, Putzito claimed that he understood everything Giliar had said, but had his own reasons for only speaking Russian. As well as this, he said he had decided to answer no one but Admiral Kolchak himself. So our interview ended. Chance had brought across my path the first of the countless pretenders who doubtless for many years to come will be a source of trouble and agitation among the ignorant and credulous masses of the Russian peasantry. The imposter's ill-fated meeting with Giliar would ultimately seal his fate, and in the end, 
Putsuto was left with no option but to confess to the deception. He was arrested but remained in a comfortable position while investigations continued. Two months following his arrest, the Red Army entered the city and Putsuto managed to escape to the Russian Far East, where he found himself under the protection of white army troops under the command of Grigory Simeonov. Once again, Putsuto attempted to play the role of Suzarevich Alexei. However, Simeonov would not be easily fooled, having previously known a Manchurian imposter who had claimed to have been the biological son of the Japanese Empress Consort Shokin who had been unable to bear children of her own and thus adopted Taisho, who had become Emperor of Japan by this time. Simeonov had no interest in the imposter's claims and thus granted him no ceremonies, opting to simply imprison the imposter. However, it would not be long until the Red Army advanced on Chide, where Putsuto was being held, and soon enough the imposter was released again, successfully convincing the investigator that he was a political prisoner who was supposedly fighting what he described as the Simeonov regime. Following this second escape from captivity, Putsuto joined the Communist Party, and after establishing a new narrative of having gone through the school of prisons and underground struggle, was appointed as a clerk by the Socialist Far Eastern Republic. The imposter's position allowed him access to classified documents and in 1921, he found himself one of the targets of a party purge which was undertaken that year. Following this arrest, one of the members of the commission, who had sat with Putsuto in the Chita prison, identified him as a pretender to the royal throne. Although he would once again find himself at liberty, Putsuto was unable to shake off the allegations made by his former cellmate, and soon enough they would catch up with him. In 1933, a time when Putsuto may have hoped his past pretensions were behind him and forgotten by those he hoped to deceive, he found himself detained in Moscow, where he resided following the Russian Civil War. On the 11th of January 1934, the NKVD Troika, who were responsible during the reign of Joseph Stalin for issuing sentences to people after simplified, speedy investigations without a public trial, sentenced Putsuto to three years in a Siberian camp on charges of calling himself the Tsar's heir Alexei Romanov and spreading rumors about the existence of a counter-revolutionary organization who were preparing to overthrow Soviet power. It is rumored that Alexei Putsuto may have had a brother by the name of Semyon Putsuto, who was a Red Army soldier serving in the 53rd Guards Rifle Division and killed in action during the Second World War in March 1943. The fate of Alexei Putsuto following his sentencing at the hands of Stalin's NKVD is unclear, however, more than 67 years later in the post-Soviet Russian Federation, Putsuto would be posthumously pardoned by the prosecutor's office in Moscow on the 23rd of April 2001. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoy the content we produce here at Heart for History, please like and subscribe. We would like to thank all of you who have so far subscribed to this channel as your support is crucial to our ongoing growth and development. If you are a returning viewer who has not yet subscribed, we would be very grateful if you would consider subscribing to our channel, as it would help us enormously in our goal of becoming a full-time channel which produces accessible, high-quality educational content on a more regular basis. If you would like to buy us a coffee, you can find our Buy Me a Coffee link both in the video description as well as on our homepage. As well as this, gratuities can also be made through our PayPal link, which can likewise be found in the video description and on our homepage. We will also be introducing the Super Thanks option to our videos, which allows viewers to buy a one-time animation on a video and send colorful, personalized comments.
Viewers in eligible locations can buy a super thanks by clicking the thanks button which is situated underneath videos which feature this option. Once again, thank you to all those who have subscribed. Please feel free to leave a comment as your feedback is greatly appreciated. Thanks again, and we'll see you again soon.